And I remember sitting in his class thinking, you know a God I don't know. He wasn't the kind of God that wanted my life. He didn't want me in some robotic way. He wanted me as a person and he wanted a relationship with me. Like I almost want to cry because I know I've been there and I just would wish that I could go give him a hug when you're working against the way God works as rubbing against the grain of the universe. <laughs> you get splinters and you're gonna get to see the story he writes and in the end when you look back on it you're gonna say it was beautiful. Hello friends it's Pat and welcome to the second episode of the I Used to Think podcast. Huge thanks to everyone who has rated the show, left comments, told me personally how much they enjoyed it. It really means a lot to me. As you can tell from the snippets in the intro, today we have a very honest and insightful conversation with my friend Miranda about her perceptions of God and how that's changed over time. We got so into the interview that we actually recorded a second interview after we had stopped recording for the first, and that can be found in a separate podcast episode. In that episode, she expands more upon how going through her parents' divorce affected her perception of God. It's a sort of a continuation of this conversation. Today's episode is called, I Used to Think God Wanted My Life. Let's get into it. Today we have Miranda on the show. Welcome. Thank you. I was thinking about the icebreaker. If you could only have three apps on your phone. I, I will uh, qualify it. Is that the word? Yes. Qualify it with, you can keep like the major ones like Safari, Messenger, Maps, but what three apps would you keep on your phone if you could only keep three? That is a really good question. What's really sad is I almost feel like I need to look on my phone <laughs> to figure out what I have on there. I mean, you can't. I don't have to. very many. <laughs> That's what I was thinking when I had this question. I was like, I bet you Miranda has like five apps on her phone. Yeah, it might be about that. And about half of those are work related. Okay. So if I take off the work ones, sorry to my boss, um, I would probably keep, I would keep my Bible app and that sounds silly, but I really do use that one frequently. Yeah. Um, I would keep my voice recorder. Oh, like the generic one that comes with the. The voice memo one. Yeah, I guess. Does that count as one that I can keep anyway? I'll let you use that for one. Okay. Just because that's cool. I didn't think about that at all. <laughs> yeah, I'd keep the voice recorder. Okay. And I'd probably keep my metronome. Oh. Because I feel like even from those three, you can see what's important to you. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm assuming voice recorders for song ideas or just notes, yes. journaling? All of the above. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. And metronomes for... It's not necessary, but I love practicing to a metronome, and I know that sounds really crazy, but it brings me a lot of peace to know that somebody else gets to keep the rhythm and I just have to follow it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're talking about playing guitar. Playing guitar, okay. yes. Got it. I love practicing scales with a metronome, which sounds dumb because no one likes that, <laughs> but I think that's one of the things that makes me breathe. It makes me relax, and so I can just sit there and play a scale to the metronome, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm good. I feel at peace. So today we have a pretty, we have a pretty shallow generic question, not, not particularly deep concerning God and your perception of God's expectations of us, his character. What is your, I, I used to think statement. My, I used to think statement is I used to think that God wanted my life and now I know that God wants me. Hmm. Start with a little background um, your even just from a broad perspective, what is your religious background, like your overall religious beliefs for those listeners that aren't familiar with Christianity or even religion in general? So I grew up in what everybody would call an well, maybe not everybody, but I I always call it a nominally Christian home, and what I mean by that is if you were to ask my parents, they would say they identify as Christians. Um. But what they really meant by that is that they would send their kids to a Christian school. Um, we would go to church pretty frequently. Mm. But as far as building in us any type of Christian character or practices at home, that really didn't happen. It was something that we would they would talk about. It felt more like an image. It was something that, oh, we go to church because 
my dad works at the church connected with the school, you know, so yeah. we go there because it's a status thing. He has to be there. He works there. Right. Um, I'm, there may have been more than that in his mind, but that's kind of what it, it felt like to me was just, we just do this because we identify with this thing. Growing up at a Christian school is a very small school, and I would say now I'm very grateful for my experience with that school. What I basically got out of it as a kid was that you were supposed to believe in Jesus so that when you died, you would go to heaven rather than hell. And so the whole the whole purpose of church or the whole purpose of the school was to get you to make that decision. And once you made that decision, then it was like, okay, well, good job. Like you're you're in. Yeah. You're... <laughs> and that was it. Right. And you had to memorize Bible verses and sing hymns, which was great and all, but I didn't get it. I just thought there were a bunch of rules and they were really pointless. It seemed like, okay, I made the decision, you know, like, that's awesome. I'm glad that I get to go to heaven, but I honestly did not understand how it applied to me past that. I just thought, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm in. Now I have to live? Like, that sounds boring. <laughs> so my, my um, life at that school was mostly growing up and learning all of these things, but not understanding that it actually applied to my personal life or to how I lived that life. Right. Your, your goal is just to change your status from yeah. going to hell to going to heaven. Mm -hmm. And then now it's it's something just out there that, that you're waiting. Like, yeah. Like you're saying, you're, with your current life, it seemed that there wasn't anything relevant to it. Yeah, other than hearing? possibly converting other people. Okay. I'm trying to think of an analogy. It was It's like you make it onto the varsity basketball team. And then now you just, your coach is like, go recruit other players. Yeah, exactly. But you never get much for like, here's this, or maybe they'll talk about strategy, right? Like, here's the strategy for how to live. Here's these moral things you're supposed to know, or these verses you're supposed to memorize. Right. But you never play the game. Or if you do, you play one-on-one, -on -one, like behind the scenes. There's never an audience. There's never a purpose to it. It never goes into a league score. There's just just there and then you just tell people like i'm on the varsity team <laughs> yeah. and then you have a jersey yeah and that's yeah that's your identity mm -hmm. so how how long would you say this was your mindset of god just wanted your life and made sure you're wearing the right jersey <laughs> it was most of my time growing up okay. it was um it was something that i think was probably more behind the scenes in my mind up until about fourth grade and fourth grade is when I really started wrestling with, um, like, I'd been told a lot in my life that I wasn't, wasn't good at really a lot. I was good at memorizing things and doing well in school, but as far as interpersonal communication, as far as expressing my emotions, as far as making good decisions, the idea was that I was terrible at all of those things. Um, that was said to me directly a number of times, and I was in this place by about fourth grade where I was absolutely convinced that I was incapable of being human. Like, I thought I was off the map. Like, unable to communicate, unable to make friends, unable to make decisions. I just felt like I was messing up all the time. And I really, I really didn't like myself. I wanted to be someone else. And so mm. I would pretend all the time to not be me. <laughs> and um, I was so fun. jealous. No, it was not fun. I was so jealous of everyone for various reasons, whether it was somebody else's cool backpack or someone's personality or whatever it was. I just didn't like myself. And the more that went on, um, the more, even though I tried not to admit it, I knew what I was saying. Every time I would say the words, I hate myself, what I really meant was I hate God because he created me and I don't understand why he built this world in such a way where he wants my life and he wants to do they could use me for something, but I'm just sitting here and I'm miserable. Mm. Um, and I kind of was in that from fourth to, it was eighth grade, of just wrestling with that for so long. <laughs> One thing I, want, I wanted to point out too was people forget how much goes on in the mind of, I mean, fourth grade, what are you, like eight? Nine years old? Oh, gosh, I don't even know. Probably not. I'm guessing nine. Something around there. You're saying all of these thoughts, 
And these are things, I mean, may, adults maybe wrestle with, mm-hmm. but you're nine years old thinking yeah. through these things. I think we easily forget how existential we can be at such a young age. Yeah. And you obviously still remember it. Vividly, yeah. yeah. How, did, how would you connect this to your view of God? Is it a very direct, like, well, this person said this about me. Now I feel worthless, essentially. So God must think I'm worthless. Like, do you think that's a very direct connection that you make and humans make in general? Or it's more like subconscious? I think that some people could make that connection really easily. Hmm. Um, and I think that would be a pretty common connection. In my mind, the connection was more, I felt that way. But I also felt like God was still going to assign me some random job and I had to be ready for it. Um, What do you mean? I mean that I had this picture of God that he, (laughs) I kind of just thought of him as up there being some cruel like toy master with a remote control. He's just waiting for the toy to sign its life off so that he can take (laughs) up the remote control and just be like, all right, you're going to Africa as a missionary and you're, well, you're not that good, but I'll use you over here. And yeah, that's fine. I'm done with that one. Throw that in the trash pile, move on to something else. That's kind of how I grew up picturing God. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know much past that. I'm curious, did you want things to change? Like, did you even think I'm going to change my viewpoint of God because no, <laughs> that sounds okay. Yeah, because I know no. for myself, I'm forced to change my viewpoint of God. I don't. Yeah. I usually don't go out and think like, this is a lie that I'm believing, and I need to go out and change things about the way that I view the world. Like that's probably the hardest thing for any human to do. Oh yeah, I don't know how. In- I'd be impressed if people could do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm thinking the only person who'd ever do it is like C.S. Lewis or something. <laughs> put it past him (laughs) yeah it was forced in the most gentle and beautiful way um i had to change my view of god and i'm so glad that he wrote that story into my life what ended up happening was i think around maybe the middle of seventh grade it could have been eighth grade too um i reached this point where i was wrestling and i felt like i was wrestling against god and i i knew that cuz I'm, I'm you know every day coming home from school screaming i hate myself punching pillows and thinking i hate mm. you too god like thank you for creating me but what i really mean is why would you do that yeah um and then go to school try to memorize bible verses and you know <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> it's an interesting juxtaposition there um but I reached this point where I was miserable, I was tired of living, and I also didn't want to die because I didn't really want to meet God. (laughs) So, I... Seems like this tension. Yeah, it was this tension of feeling like there was no hope unless I just surrendered my life and gave him what I thought he wanted. Gave him control. And so, I one day decided to just say, God, you can have my life. And... When I did that, I really, really genuinely expected him to pick up the remote control with all delight and just start going and start giving me assignments. However, I don't know how I really thought that was going to happen, but that's how I pictured it was he's just going to give me an assignment. I'm going to go do it and it's going to be miserable, but at least I'm not, at least I'm being obedient now. Um, Yeah. Some kind of like twisted purpose. Yeah. At least some kind of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And what I was surprised to find out is he didn't do anything. I was just waiting. And it felt a little more peaceful in the sense that I wasn't fighting anymore, but I was still just sitting there in this weird peace knowing that I had at least given up, but there wasn't much point in living anymore. And in that, in that place, um, it was probably the, the best place I'd been in in a, in a number of years in the sense that I was, I at least felt at peace, um, but I didn't really know, like it was just kind of waking up, doing what I had to do at school and then going home I wasn't screaming anymore but Hmm. I wasn't doing much else you know and then when it really started flipping was in eighth grade um I had a bible teacher who everybody loved him at the school because he was the kind of teacher that could joke with the kids (laughs) he would call us nincompoops and we thought that was great (laughs) (laughs) I've heard that word probably ever (laughs) he would do this thing where he would um we would all be working on something in the class and He'd be quiet at his desk, and then he would just say, hey, nincompoops, and we all look up, and he would be like, ha-ha, you know, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought it was so funny. 
Um, but he was just so kind. And he honestly was the first person I had ever seen who, who taught about God as if he had a relationship with him, like he knew him as a person and not just a concept. Mm -hmm. And he also lived with continual joy. He was always talking about how much he loved the Lord. And it was so much fun, so much fun to learn from him. He completely made the scriptures come alive in a way that none of my other teachers had. And I think that was because he, he genuinely loved the Lord and had a relationship with him. And when I watched that, I felt like, I mean, he's just cool. He's just a unique individual. There's no hope for that for me at first. Um, and then in the middle of when I was in class with him, he lost his wife to cancer. Mm -hmm. And I was just at that point like, well, great. You know, like the one guy who seems like he has it figured out. Now he loses his wife. He's going to come back. He's going to be all angry and forget this, you know. But Not be happy anymore. Yeah. Take it out like, on you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he didn't. He came back. After a short leave of absence, he came back and in tears, he was saying the exact same thing he had said before. He said that he loved God and that God was the only thing in his life that was making this worth it and that was giving him like reason to keep living, that he was still going to keep praising him and then he knew he'd be okay. And I remember sitting in his class thinking, you know a God I don't know. Wow. I've never heard of this kind of God before. Yeah. And I went home that day after hearing him say those things. And I just remember praying and saying, God, I don't know you. I don't have any idea who you are. I've been so wrong about who I thought you were. He, were. he knows you and I don't know you. But what I realized in that moment was he wasn't the kind of God that wanted my life. He didn't want me in some robotic way. He wanted me as a person and he wanted a relationship with me mm. and so I told him I want to know you I want to know who you really are not who I think you are and I want my mind to be changed right and he the Lord led me to scripture and I think that part of that was probably the influence of the Christian school they always tell you like this is how you know God you read this book <laughs> um but also I think that was I think that was the Lord really saying this is how you know me and I just started reading it, and that changed everything. It really changed everything. Does this teacher know about the story? I hope so. He was he was let go from the school not that long okay. after that um, for reasons that I'm sure I don't know the complete story, but it was grievous. Like the students were s devastated. Yeah. Um. Cause yeah, it was. <laughs> wasn't fair um but he has had more of an impact on my life than probably anyone in an unintentional kind of way yeah because for him I'm, I'm sure part of his mind was thinking you know I want these kids to know how God's love affects me even in suffering but at the same time that's just him like mm -hmm. that's his response to suffering Mm -hmm. that was him at his most broken and that's what came out right exactly yeah that's a better way to put it very <laughs> precise <laughs> i wanted to rewind a little bit okay thinking back to okay when the punching pillows era of your life i'm thinking from the perspective of someone who's listening who's still in that stage mm. or even nowhere close like they don't believe in a god or they don't believe in a higher power why even bother saying a prayer like God, I hate you. Because in that moment, you're still talking to God. Yeah. Like, why is it even worth addressing him then? That's a good question. I don't know if it would be the same for everyone. But for me, I didn't have ever any doubt that God existed. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, creation itself was evidence of that. Like, who could have made this other than somebody like God? Um, and obviously, I had really wacky ideas of who he was um but i felt like he i i somehow felt like he knew what i was thinking anyway and so i might as well say it to his face so it's like i believe you exist and that i'm fine with that part mm -hmm. i don't like who you are even if you do exist yeah and I'll, i'm gonna let you know about it mm -hmm. it's so messed up in so many ways because that wasn't who he was 
Right. I didn't give him a chance to introduce himself. After your teacher came and you saw his response to mm -hmm. all the horrible things that happened, how did your behavior begin to change? Because I can see the mindset change of like, okay, mm -hmm. this is a God that I've had a false image of. How does that change the way you, you begin to act? It was gradual for sure. Um, one thing that changed very quickly was knowing I, like, I just, I knew I needed to read scripture. And so I didn't realize what I was doing at the time was spiritual discipline, but I just started telling myself, you're going to try to read some of this book every day. And, um, I would pull it out in the morning before I would get ready for school. And then I'd pull it out in the evening after I finished my homework and just do that every single day as much as I could. I wasn't perfect at it by any means, but mm. that changed, um, that habit of, of trying to read his word. And, um, I also started taking my Bible classes and our chapels at the school a lot more seriously, realizing, oh, these people coming to speak are actually trying to tell me more about this God who I'm trying to know. Um, so I started digging into that and trying to figure out what are they saying and how does this apply? And then trying to listen to it, trying to practice it, trying to say like, okay, so they said that I, I shouldn't lie. So <laughs> I'm going to try to practice that, you know, um, in the sense that that's what is honoring to God. And you're trying to be like him is what I was trying to imitate. So a lot of that had to do with integrity. And then another thing that I guess started to change very gradually was my image of myself and how I dealt with and talked to myself. And that's something that I think took until really about halfway through college um, to realize how damaging those words were that I was saying to myself and not using those anymore. <laughs> um, trying to realize that God loved me and speaking love over myself rather than hatred. If the self-narrative when you were younger was, I hate myself, what is what is the self-narrative now? And are you, are you the type of person that, like, you say affirmations in the morning? No. Kind of a thing? <laughs> no. Or what is... What is the, what do you say over yourself now? A lot of it is reversing it. So like if a thought comes up, like, because it still, it still comes up sometimes, um, the thought that I hate myself, then I'll just say, no, no, I reject and renounce that in the name of Jesus Christ. That's not true. That's not how I actually feel about myself. And that's not how he feels about me. I think the one that makes me smile the most is when I just take that thought and say, yeah, well, even if it was true, Jesus loves you anyway. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> I like that. I like that. It's almost like a, for lack of a better term, it's like a forced, how do I describe it? Oh, I always think about this. Okay, so uh, have you seen Avengers, which one is it? Avengers Endgame, right? That's the last one? I think it's the last one. I have not seen it. Oh, Sorry. man. <laughs> So should I not use this analogy? I mean, it's up to you. I don't mind if you spoil it for me. Do you watch the Marvel Universe? Some of them. Kind of? Okay. I wasn't planning on watching that one. Okay. At the end of Endgame, when it seems like all things are hopeless, there's mm -hmm. a scene where Captain Mer And listeners will probably correct me, because the last time I saw it was when it came out. Okay. Where Captain America is like on his knees, and Thanos has like broken his shield, and it seems like all things are hopeless. And then the music starts to build mm -hmm. and obviously things are going to turn around and then portals start to open and all the heroes that had disappeared during, I think they called the blip. Okay. Have returned now to help fight against Thanos. Oh, that's awesome. And I remember in the theater, me and my very theological existential mind is like, <laughs> oh my goodness, that's the love of God. Hmm. I've, I remember writing about this probably in some high school blog posts, but for the longest time, the love of God to me was like, like a cotton ball or something hmm. like soft and fuzzy. Mm -hmm. When you, when you hear like God loves you in a sermon, you're just supposed to be like, Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember watching Endgame thinking, I think that's what the love of God really looks like is like portals opening, <laughs> like a superheroes coming through and like this unstoppable force. And, esp and especially with the picture of Captain America, like on his knees with a broken shield. That is when the love of God usually forces itself in, where it's, to a certain extent, you have to believe it. Like, you have to mm -hmm. receive it. You have to 
take time to actually believe that God loves you. But at the same time, it's like all, all of this water like rushing in that you can't stop, like a dam being broken. Yeah. And I think that kind of image, at the, I know it helped me because otherwise, what's a con ball going to do for me when a spouse has cancer or when yeah. I'm having major depression or I lose a job? And instead, it's this like unstoppable force that, that comes through. And I liked how you mentioned, you, that's what I'm getting from how you're describing, like when the love of God really hit you and you like registered. Yeah, it's, it's a relentless pursuit of us. Yes. It, it, songwriters have described it as like a hurricane or a torrent or who, whatever they want to call it. But it, yeah, it runs you over. It absolutely pursues you. And you think you're going to be pursued in such a way where you're scared once it catches up, but then you realize it's the absolute best thing that ever happened. Hmm. What would you say to someone who's in the pillow punching phase? Or maybe they had that kind of defeat moment, that surrender moment, but it's more of like a, I don't care what happens to me and I'm just going to like go do whatever I want and not bother and like put my Bible on the shelf and not bother with it again. I think, like, I almost want to cry because I know I've been there. And yeah. I just would wish that I could go give him a hug. Hmm. You know, because I think that's what I needed. I just needed a hug. And just to have someone tell me, like, no, that's not who he is. That's not who he is. He's good. And, and he created you, and you were so beautiful. And he didn't just create you to use you. He created you because he likes you. Yeah. He thought you were a really good addition to this universe. And it's going to get better. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to let them go. Like, I would want to just keep hugging them and open that Bible with them and share, with, like, go straight into the prophets and share with them those poetic texts of the Lord just saying how much he loves his people. Like, he doesn't even, I mean, he cares when we sin or when we do things wrong against him, but... The amount of love that he pours out in those poems of just saying, like, you're pursuing broken cisterns. You you run away from me, the source of living water. I want you. <laughs> I want to go woo you as my bride. I want you to be mine. And I'm going to keep pursuing you. And so I would, if I could, I would just want to wrap them in a hug <laughs> and stay with them there. Until they could see that that's the love of God. Sometimes that early relationship with the Lord is, I treasure that so much. And sometimes that, that was when it felt easy, you mm. know? Yeah. Yeah. But the difference though, is that like back before meeting him and realizing he was different than I ever knew was having to face that alone and also intention against him, which um, I forgot who said it, but somebody described that when you're working against the way God works as rubbing against the grain of the universe <laughs> and you get splinters. Um, huh. That's what it feels like when you're living in tension against God. So the difference now is realizing like I may be a pain in the butt, you know, at times and I'm, I'm really hard headed and I know I punch against the Lord's chest all the time. Uh, but the difference is I know that he's not about to punch me back. He's hugging me and he's wrapping me in his arms. And eventually he knows I'm going to collapse with my head on his chest. And he's going to be like, all right, I still love you. Let's keep going. And he's always there. Your story before when I asked you, um, there was a phrase that came to mind that I remember okay. hearing in college that God not only loves you, but he likes you. Yeah. And that's kind of the the message that I'm getting from your story of, I think someone can go through their whole life believing God loves them in the sense as best as they have been communicated love. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of them, like you said, comes from people close to you. Like that person who said, you know, you're only good for blank. Like that was your perception of love, mm -hmm. but it's a completely different thing to believe that someone likes you because it means they, they want to spend time with you. Mm -hmm. You know, they're interested in what you're going through. Yeah. I mean, you just think about like friends, like you ask your friend, what are you doing today? 
like, what are you going to do this weekend? Like, I picture Jesus asking the, us those kinds of things mm -hmm. more than just like, I love you. And then it's just like this universal statement he just gives to everyone to mm -hmm. make sure he's doing it rather than, I mean, how much it means to someone you ask, like, how's your day been? Yeah. Like those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. I think people forget that God asks those types of questions too. <laughs> Yeah, he totally does. And isn't that a lot of times what prayer is? Like, mm. you get to go tell him, like, thank you, Lord, for this day. You know, we get to talk about this day with you. We're having a conversation. He cares about the things that we care about. And we can talk to him about those things. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, of course. I, I don't think I told you, but I saw the About Me section on your blog. So as you're telling the story, I was like, oh, that's the story on your blog. Yeah. So I don't know if you want people to go to your blogging, but... Sure. Yeah, if they'd like to, you can find it at thatnewdirection.blogspot.com. It's called An Eyeglass of Hope. Okay. Are you still actively writing? I am. Yeah, it's there? not like super regular. It's mostly just when I feel like I have something to say, but okay. it is the most recent post I think was October of last year. Okay. From your story, I think there are a lot of people who can relate. And a lot of people who might not even realize that they're going through what mm. you did until they hear you say, yeah, I hated myself and I hated God. <laughs> but just even recognizing that, I mean, that is a huge first step that can lead to a lot of healing mm -hmm. and a lot of glorious things later on. So, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Of course.